Hi, it is Tuesday, May the 3rd, and I continue to read and wonder my way through the book of Exodus. And today we're in Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. Uh, and we continue to go through um, the plagues, right? Uh, Aaron and Moses following God's instruction, keep confronting Pharaoh. And so far we had the water of the Nile was turned um, into uh, to blood. There was a warning and it happened. Then there were frogs all over the land. Again, there was a warning and Pharaoh said, sure, go. And then, no, you can't go. Then there were gnats with no warning, fleas everywhere. Uh, then there were flies. Again, there was a warning. And, um, but then, um, oh, and the flies didn't hit the Israelites. That was a big thing, just the Egyptians. Um, and then, yeah, Pharaoh gave in, but nope, changed his mind. Then there was pestilence to kill all the livestock, but not the Israelites' livestock. Um, and that also came with a warning. Uh, but then there were boils, no warning. Then we had lots of warning before the hail. That was yesterday, because it was hail and fire and, and lightning and everything. Uh, and, uh, and it was dramatic. And Pharaoh repented. I mean, had the warning and ignored the warning, but then it happened and Pharaoh repented. I mean, use the language, I have sinned, was really out there. Um, really all the right words, um, but no. No, 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 didn't actually. And Moses knew that. Moses said, you guys haven't really. You don't really, you and your officials don't really have the fear of the Lord. Um, but we did notice that some of the officials kind of maybe did because they went and protected um, their uh, their livestock and their workers as God suggested they might do. Um, so now we pick up with uh, number eight. So that we've got seven and here is number eight. Exodus 10 verses 1 to 20. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his officials, in order that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I made fools of the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, so that you may know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, so that they may worship me. For if you refuse to let my people go, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country. They shall cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. They shall devour the last remnant left after the hail, and they shall devour every tree of yours that grows in the field. They shall fill your houses and the houses of all your officials and of all the Egyptians, something that neither your parents nor your grandparents have seen from the day they came on earth to this day. And then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Pharaoh's officials said to him, How long shall this fellow be a snare to us? Let the people go so that they may worship the Lord their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go, worship the Lord your God. But which ones are to go? Moses said, We will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and daughters and with our flocks and herds, because we have the Lord's festival to celebrate. And he said to them, The Lord indeed will be with you if I ever let your little ones go with you. Plainly you have some evil purpose in mind. No, never. Your men may go and worship the Lord, for that is what you are asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt, so that the locusts may come upon it and eat every plant in the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when morning came, the east wind had brought the locusts. The locusts came upon all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a dense swarm of locusts as has never been seen before, nor ever shall be again. They covered the surface of the whole land so that the land was black. And they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Nothing green was left, no tree, no plant in the field in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh hurriedly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Do forgive my sin just this once and pray to the Lord your God that at least he may, he may remove his deadly thing from me. So he went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. The Lord changed the wind to a very strong west wind, which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go.
So what do we make of this? Hmm. Well, we 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 have another another plague. Uh, this one again with 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 warning. Pharaoh ignores the warning, uh, and then this is the plague that sort of picks up where the last one left off. Remember, we we'd heard that the that some of the grain, the spelt, and the wheat they, that they were they were spared. The barley was destroyed, but the later blooming crops. Well, this is going to clean all that up too. So God showed mercy, but. But, but here's the problem for me. I mean, sometimes it's Pharaoh hardens his heart, and sometimes God Pharaoh's hardens heart. Pharaoh uh, hardens Pharaoh's heart, and here God makes it clear: uh, I'm doing this. I've hardened his hearts and the hearts of the officials. Remember, some officials did what God said, I, I, sure as a way of protecting their investment, their workers and their livestock, but also because they were, in, I think, acknowledging. Acknowledging God's 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 power, God's God's place in all of this, they were respecting God. Even here, when they're saying to 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 Pharaoh, like seriously, just let them go, and you see, we're ruined. But God hardens their hearts as well, so God does not want this to be resolved, and and that's a tricky one for me to figure out. Why does God prolong this? Why does God prolong the suffering? Now we're told, as I mentioned, we're told. And so that God does this so that the signs may be seen um, for all the people. And that they may, that, that, that you, talking to Moses and Aaron and therefore the Israelites, that you may tell your children and grandchildren about how I made fools of the Egyptians and the signs I did among them. So if this had ended early, it isn't as good a story, I guess. If this had ended early, it might have just stayed something internal, something that Pharaoh and his officials dealt with. But this is something for all the people to experience and to see. Surely by now they also recognize that Pharaoh um, is not trustworthy, is not um, honorable. Pharaoh says, I give up, I give up, I'll give you anything you want. And then as soon as the tragedy or, or the, the effects of the plague are removed, uh, Pharaoh in their eyes, changes his mind. Sometimes it's because Pharaoh has hardened his heart, but sometimes it's because God has Pharaoh has 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 um, hardened Pharaoh's heart. God seems to be undermining everything that the Egyptians believe in. Right? We went through it before, and we talked about some specific um, deities, spirits, gods from from the Nile to uh, uh, fertility. There's a cow god, of course. There are gods who take care of the grain. There are sky gods, of course, big time. And we've so so God through these plagues has undermined all of them. And there is this idea too that Pharaoh is divine or divinely connected. Pharaoh is 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 elevated in a divine way from the people, so he is like a god. So perhaps part of this is also to undermine Pharaoh's authority, Pharaoh's place in all of this. So God undermines all of that. God basically uh, reveals all of the false gods for what they are. False. They have no. They have no power. They cannot be trusted. Right, the fertility god, uh, you like frogs, I'm going to give you lots of frogs. Um, you know, you protect the Nile, well, I'm going to turn the Nile in, into blood. Um, and, and, and done with humor, I mentioned that earlier on, we should laugh. Um, Osiris is said to have the, the river Nile um, in, in his blood. Well, <laughs> there you go, isn't that kind of funny? We are mocking them and undermining these gods um, to say that they don't have any power. But also, as we undermine Pharaoh, we also acknowledge that Pharaoh cannot be relied upon. None of the Egyptian gods, none of the Egyptian theology is reliable. Um, God is showing that. Had Pharaoh, perhaps in the very beginning, recognized who God was or the power of God, had shown respect to God, then maybe this doesn't have to happen. Although then it would have just been between Pharaoh and God or Pharaoh and Moses. And that wasn't the point. We want the people to see it. We just, we read that. We're also read that we're meant to tell the story again and again and again. Um, this is so that you may tell your sons, right? You may tell your children and your grandchildren. You may tell them what has happened. So, so you and me, 
no, you and I, you and I, so many thousands of years later, that's part of it. We, we're meant to be telling the story and wondering about it, not as a history lesson, but what is it saying to us? Um, so this does say something about, about false idols, about those things that we reveal um, that actually have become our gods. I argue that that um, that <sighs> capitalism, business, um, uh, the profit uh, ethic uh, has become our god. Everything's okay as long as well. It's only business. I know this isn't fair, but the investors need to make their money. Um, I think we often do worship that. I'm not. I'm not anti-capitalism. Capitalism has served me. Uh, I think it's served me well. Maybe, maybe it hasn't. Maybe it's done terrible things to me. But I have worked, lived within it fairly well. So I'm not going to throw it all aside. But most of the problems um, in, my, in my society, in the world as I see it, come from those who are pursuing wealth, believing that wealth will give them security, and it doesn't. Uh, believing that going after wealth is okay, you can compromise everything else in the name of, well, it's only business. Surely the investors have a right to a profit too. And as long as they're allowed to a profit, aren't they allowed to have a maximum profit? So, and I think, I, I think that, that, well, the way that I approach my faith um, more and more every day undermines those, those assumptions and proves that they are false and unreliable. Um, and yet I still hang on to them. <laughs> I still engage in, in capitalism. I still uh, live in a society where, yeah, where I, where I negotiate for a better salary, for the best salary, the best benefits I can in my ministry. I, I don't just simply say, well, it's my calling. Whatever you want to give me will be fair. No, no, I negotiate and have negotiated hard at times. So I can't just throw that aside. But that gets me thinking about Pharaoh and Pharaoh's heart hardening. Pharaoh does it sometimes. God does it sometimes. Um, God, if Pharaoh means to, and then Pharaoh doesn't mean to, and yet it still happens. It almost feels to me a little bit like an addiction. So I'm taking out for the moment the literal reading to suggest that Pharaoh hardens his own heart sometimes, and when Pharaoh's not going to do that, it looks like Pharaoh's about to maybe capitulate. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Um, so, um, so it's not entirely Pharaoh's fault. I'm taking that away um, right now. I'm going to take the literal reading of that off the table. And as I look at Pharaoh and imagine myself as Pharaoh, I can start to recognize the signs of addiction. I'm going to give this thing up, and then I do. I give this thing up, and I and I am so sure I'm going to give this up. And then I, oh my God, I just want to do this thing. And so I tell myself, no, no, people don't have the right to accept. No, I can do it if I want to. The hell with how, how this affects my family, my friends, the rest of my life. No, I'll do this because I want to. And so I dive back into my addiction, whatever that addiction may be. I'm not speaking as one who's revealing an addiction to you. Um, but having spent time with lots of addicts and having things in my life that are often compelling. Um, you know, so that addiction can be alcohol and drugs. It could be shopping. It can be... Um, all sorts of things. Anger can be an addiction for people. Um, uh, you know, everything from, uh, yeah, from, from pornography to, to, to shopping to drinking, all of these things. And people on their own try and they, and they, and they, and they get a resolve and they're fine. But every now and again, their conscience goes, why should I have to do, why do I have to change my life? And they harden their hearts. And then every now and again, Things are going really well, and they trip up, and they can't figure out why. Why did I fall back into that? Why did I have to open that bottle of wine? Why did I do that? Somebody gives them an opportunity that actually feeds their addiction. Again, it can be an invitation. It can be a gift. It can be all sorts of things. And they find themselves caught in the midst of that addictive behavior again. And they look around, but I, I didn't mean to. It wasn't, it wasn't my fault. It's almost as if God has hardened their hearts. And I don't think God has. But when we're fighting addiction, sometimes we give up the fight and sometimes the fight just tricks us. 
as I listen to this, that starts to make sense to me. So if I, if I, if I, if I don't imagine right now that this story is about the nation of Israel and how it comes to be eventually in Cana, how it goes into the wilderness for 40 years, how it's got out of Egypt. If, if I don't think it's about that, if I look at Pharaoh as a sympathetic character or somebody that I, I can identify with, I can see Pharaoh fighting addiction, arguing for self-interest always. I can see that. I can see that in the responses to all of the plagues thus far. The negotiating with it. Well, I can do it the way I want to do it. I mean, we've heard Pharaoh negotiate before. Pharaoh will negotiate again here. Um, trying to catch Moses and God out on a technicality. Fine, go. Go, you win. You win, I give in. Go, worship the Lord. Okay. But which ones are to go? And Moses is like, all of them. No, 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 no. That's not how that's going to work. No, no, no. No, no, your men can go. Because your men are the ones who do the religious -y things. But the women and the children, no, they're going to stay. They're going to stay because that way I'm sure you're going to come back and work for us. That way I'm not going to lose. I'm going to keep my pride and keep my win on this. I have watched people um, battle um, uh, an addiction to alcohol, um, trying to trying to, to manage... Um, and and saying, well, then you know, I'm just I'm just never gonna drink liquor again. I can have beer. Anyone can have a beer for goodness sake. Of course, I can have a beer. No, that's what I'm. Yeah, no, no, you have to tell me what to do. No, I'll be just fine. I'm gonna have a beer because I'm not really an alcoholic. I just have a problem with whiskey. We negotiate it so that we don't lose face. And I'm sure there are people who have managed to do such things, but um, the ones that come to my mind found that it worked for a little while until it didn't work at all. Um, the negotiation didn't play out. I can see this happening with Pharaoh. And I don't know that the author of Exodus has meant me to read this into it. But I take to heart, in order that I may show these signs of mine among them and that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I made fools of the Egyptians and the signs I've done among them, if I take this out of the literal and make it metaphor, if I mean this story to be told again and again and again, I'm going to tell you, this many thousands of years later, I don't care how Israel came to leave Egypt. But I do care about the things I recognize in this story that strike me. I do care because I understand a little bit what it's like to be Pharaoh. I get what it's like to be Moses even and Aaron, all of them. This becomes parable for me. I, I can reflect it into my own life. But right now, I'm just focusing on, on, on Pharaoh. And then there's that great question in, in, in verse 3. Um, so Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Without sharing too much um, of things that are not mine to share, um, but that's part of of twelve step programs. Whether we're talking alcohol uh, or or a variety of other things, but using that basic thing, what part of it is is having to admit that we're powerless. Um, for some, um, for for most, traditionally, it, it's also about um, acknowledging, accepting a higher power. How long before will you refuse to humble yourself before me? I wonder how often I really humble myself before God. Um, I have been present um, in, in what we call the, the, the black church, primarily uh, in, in the U.S., but also in Canada um, and, and other places. But I've been into the, into, the, in, into the black church that differs from the church I grew up in. Um, in that it is often filled with gratitude. No matter how things are going, we thank God. Uh, lots of thanking God. The church that I grew up in, the churches that I lead now, we don't talk about thanking God. I mean, we do, but our emphasis is on how can we help you, God? 
God, please direct us to help the poor. God, please direct us to help the prisoner. God, please, you know, how do we, so, so God, we want to add our feeble efforts to your great efforts. But the fact is we're going to be your ally. We, we're, we're offering to help God out because maybe God can't get the job done without our help. Um, it's a relationship with God, uh, but it's not one that's actually filled with humility when you think about it. Um, there is an allyship there, which is based on us being convinced that our own power is something that God would would ask for. Hey, Norm, can you help me move this sofa? Um, not a lot of humility there. Uh, having said that, I'm not about to throw away the way that I do church or the way that my community engages in church, but I am aware that churches that speak more of gratitude are speaking out of humility. They are humble and they are God. They are thankful for what God has done for them. Uh, there is that sense that I don't myself deserve it. And we in our, my church often talk about how we do, how, how God loves us and that, and that it's not that it's not that we deserve it, but the way we talk about it almost sounds like it. Um, we'll say we don't deserve it, but we sound like we we kind of do. Whereas I have seen other churches, other Christian communities, when they talk about not deserving it, um, you can feel that they do not feel worthy. And I would say, oh no, but you are worthy. You're wonderfully created by God. I think of the years ago when, when uh, within my church community, uh, they tried to, well, and in fact, they, they did for many, uh, rewrite the words of Amazing Grace. Uh, it was Amazing Grace, uh, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me is the line. And people say, no, 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 wretch, we don't, we don't, we are not wretches. No, 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 it saved a soul like mine. Um, softened it a little bit because we don't like to feel wretched. Oh, we don't like to identify with the wretch, but that's part of the humility. We're not great at that. And without humility, it's been my uh, observation that sobriety is hard to come by. Um, Pharaoh needs a little humility. Pharaoh needs to be able to not have to win or negotiate this in a way that maintains his pride. Pharaoh has to let go of his pride and find his identity, uh, his strength in God. Um, hmm. Okay, I'm now turning this into a sermon and I've gone long enough. So I'm going to stop and leave this with you. There's other things in this passage that are worthy of wonder. Lots of things that if I had an hour, I could play around with. But I think I'm going to stop there because I went down a road that, well, I'm going to spend some more time today thinking about that road. It's been an interesting road for me. Anyway, let me stop and offer a prayer. Loving God, we thank you for this time of wonder. Wonder that opens us up to you, to, to your magnitude to 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 the depth of of your love of your presence frees us up from the sense that we can simply decipher you in scripture and know you but in wonder and imagination recognize that you are more than we've ever imagined so much more that we can we can expect to hear you anew today. Hear you say something to us that we've never heard before. God, let our imaginations be a gateway to humility as we hear your word again and again and recognize there is nowhere that we can go that you're not already there. There is nothing that we can experience that you, that you don't have a word for us to help us, to guide us to strengthen us. God, in all humility, just thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this day. Thank you. Well, thank you for everything. We pray in Jesus' name through the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Well, friends, that's it for today. But until I get to see you tomorrow, um, please know that whether you feel blessed and full of life or you feel wretched, the truth is you are blessed. You are loved by God. Um, and, uh, and not only that, you reveal God's love in the world. You truly do. Um, so what you do matters. It matters a great deal. So keep doing it, please. God bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow. We'll see what happens then.